All right, well, welcome back after lunch. Um, we have Jeremy Hahn giving a half hour talk on the mod PV1 motivic filtration on the topological cyclic homology of topological K theory. And anybody uh, watching through Zoom, you're certainly welcome to just type up and ask questions or do the chat and we'll figure that out as well. All right, well, um, thank you. Um, thank you a lot for inviting me here to give a talk. I can't say how happy I am to be out after two and a half years of lockdown. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just give a, a little summary of the results in this recent paper that was posted with Arpon Raxit and Dylan Wilson. And of course, it's been just a tremendous honor to get to learn and, and work with them. Um, so yeah, let me just try to summarize a little bit what's in our paper. Um, so maybe the, the basic concept that we're studying is is an E-infinity ring, and we want to understand um, even E-infinity rings versus E-infinity rings that are not necessarily even. So we say an E-infinity ring is even if its homotopy groups are in, are in even degrees. So this is a pretty standard notion, and things like complex bordism, mu, ku. So this lowercase ku means the connective cover of the two periodic ku. These are all even. Their homotopy groups are only in even degrees. Any classical ring, think of as an eilenberg maclean spectrum concentrated in degree zero, that's also even. But we have lots of examples of interesting rings that aren't even, like the sphere or KO, which is the connective cover of the eight periodic real K theory. Uh, and there's sort of a standard technique in homotopy theory, particularly chromatic homotopy theory, of trying to uh, understand interesting rings like KO that aren't even by approximating them with even rings that are supposed to be easier to understand. Um, so there's a universal way to do that, which uh, I'd like to introduce. So the idea of this so-called even filtration is that it's the universal way of approximating an arbitrary E infinity ring using even E infinity rings. So it's not a very complicated definition. The nth filtered piece we just take the limit over all E infinity ring maps into even rings of the Posnikov cover, the whitehead cover. So this, this, uh, these whitehead covers, they map to each other and you get a filtration on the ring you started with um, that we call the even filtration. And uh, a good question is, since this is the universal, the universal approximation by even rings, we're taking all E infinity ring maps into all even rings, how could we ever understand the filtration that we get out? Um, it's not, I think, clear. Um, it wasn't clear to me that, that this would be a, a reasonably tractable notion, um, but at least in one case, it's, it's easy, right? If A is even, then the filtration is just the double speed Posnikov because there's an initial object an initial uh, even E infinity ring that A maps to called A itself. Um, and if you want to formalize this, you have to use this right con extension, and there's some set theoretic issues, but we'll quickly restrict attention to situations where the set theoretic issues provably aren't real. Um, right, so how could we ever understand the even filtration on something that wasn't even to begin with? Well, we formulate this notion of a evenly free map. So the idea of an evenly free map is it's, it's some kind of condition on a map of E infinity rings, and it uh, lets us descend the even filtration. So if A to B is an evenly free map, then we can calculate the even filtration on A just by taking uh, the cosimplicial object associated to the map from A to B and, and totalizing the even filtration on the objects that appear in that cosimplicial spectrum or that cosimplicial E infinity ring. Um, and so it's, it's really not that hard to prove this theorem. This isn't a deep theorem. This is, some, this is just what you need to check about a map uh, in order for the even filtration to descend. So the thing you have to check is that uh, whenever you have a map from A to some even thing, then the push out, this tensor product, is a free C module concentrated in even degrees. Or really, you can do some sort of faithfully flat variant, but 
for all practical purposes, the way we understand the even filtration is by finding these maps of evenly free rings, these maps A to B, such that for all maps A to C into something even, this pushout is a free C module. All right, so I want to give you some examples of evenly free maps. So here's an important one, the map from S to MU. So MU is an E infinity ring, it has a unit map, um, and I want to explain that that is evenly free. So the condition to check is that if you have any even E infinity ring receiving a map from S, well, that's just the unit map into that even thing, then we have to check that the tensor product of the even thing with MU over the sphere is a free C module in even degrees. But uh, we can calculate the tensor product of C with MU because C is even, so there's a Tom isomorphism. And for any even ring uh, C, the C homology of MU is just a polynomial ring on some generators called BI, where BI lives in degree 2i. So in particular, um, uh, you know, this, uh, this group is a free C star module in even degrees, which means that the spectrum is a free C module in even degrees. Uh, and as a corollary, we can calculate uh, the even filtration on the sphere as the totalization of even filtrations on this Adams Novikov resolution. But the Adams Novikov resolution is entirely consisting of even things, so we understand that the even filtration is just the Posnikov filtration. Okay, and so um, from this we learn that uh, we get a filtration. The associated graded of that filtration is the E2 page of the Adams Novikov spectral sequence. So uh, this is a familiar thing from motivic homotopy theory over the complex numbers, if you're familiar with that. And this is a filtration whose uh, associated graded is the E2 page of the Adams Novikov spectral sequence. So I think that's kind of nice because we uh, just recovered the Adams Novikov spectral sequence uh, solely using this notion of evenness without, you know, we used. MU to check that we get the Adams Novikov filtration, but without knowing about MU, you can define the even filtration and recover the Adams Novikov spectral sequence. Um, so that's one example. Uh, here's another example. So THH of MU, uh, it maps to MU, and uh, it turns out that that's evenly free. So let me just run through the argument, it's pretty simple. So if we have any map from THMU to some even E infinity ring, we have to study this, uh, this tensor product here, where C is some generic even E infinity ring. So the only way we're gonna be able to understand that tensor product in great generality is by understanding this Tor spectral sequence in great generality. And uh, THH star MU is uh, not so complicated, it's just an exterior algebra over MU star on odd degree classes. So that's, I think, proved by Owen, um, Blumberg, and Schrick rule, and it also is found in some papers of uh, Rognes, and um, it's a not too hard effect. Um, so you have these odd degree classes, and then the point is that if C is even homotopy, all the odd degree classes have to go to zero. There's nothing they could hit because C is even. And that immediately implies that the Tor spectral sequence collapses, and we learn that uh, the homotopy groups of this tensor product are uh, a free pi star of C module uh, with generators indexed by some divided power thing. But anyway, they're a free pi star of C module on even degree things. Um, and so the spectral sequence collapses by evenness and everything is good. And we learn that this map is evenly free. So these are the two basic arguments that are used over and over again to prove things are evenly free. This argument that exterior generators have to map to zero if they're an odd degree and the other argument about uh, Tom isomorphisms and new homology of even things. Um, okay, so uh, what can this be used for? So I want to advertise a, a little, um, well, a little result, which is that uh, the fact that this is evenly free immediately implies that this other expression is evenly free. That's totally formal. If you just push around the definitions, you'll find that that's true. Um, and what that means is that we can study the even filtration on THH of KU uh, by descending the even filtration on, on this object, whatever this object is. Uh, and Dylan Wilson and I proved that this object is even, and so are the various tensor powers that show up in the descent. And uh, 
So we, we can really understand THH of KU in theory using some kind of understanding of the cosimplicial object associated to this descent. So this was done by uh, David Lee, who is in the audience here. And uh, he really came up with a number of very elegant tricks for working with that Hopf algebraid that's presented by this cosimplicial object. And uh, as a result, using the even filtration, he was able to completely compute THH of KU. It seems like a pretty basic computation. Fundamental object, compute THH star of KU. Lots of people had made computations related to this. Uh, for example, Asuni computed that mod the bot element, but didn't compute the uh, bot element Bachstein, and Engelwhite Hill Lawson computed something about the THH of the atom summand, but not about the THH of KU itself. Uh, and so if you look at the work of people like Engelwhite Hill Lawson or Suni, um, they sort of do some very uh, interesting arguments where they're comparing multiple different approaches, multiple different spectral sequences, and they're using sparsity, and they're using power operations, whereas with this even filtration, David proves that everything kind of flows from the known structure of mu star, mu star mu as a Hopf algebra, which is something that uh, you can read in, in Ravenel's Green Book. Um, and so this sort of turns the problem into an algebraic one, where the, the translation to algebra is accomplished by things very familiar to homotopy theorists, like this very familiar Hopf algebra. Uh, and moreover, David found some really elegant ideas about what THH star of VPN and THH star of other things might look like, and he wrote some of that at the end of his preprint, and you should definitely talk to him about them. And in some sense, these conjectures of his are purely algebraic, or um, maybe solved through algebraic means, but something to do with the algebra of formal groups. Okay, so that's one completely new computation we get immediately. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to state some results without really going into any kind of proofs. Um, but uh, I want to just give a, a feeling for the kind of things we do in, in this paper. Um, so here's, here's a big one. Uh, so let R be some discrete ring. So now I'm going to study a classical discrete ring again. Um, and I'm going to have to have some assumptions on this ring that it's reasonably nice. And those assumptions are true for any regular Noetherian ring or even in quotient by a regular sequence. So a lot of reasonably nice rings. Um, and under those assumptions, we can take the even filtration of THH of R. Uh, and so what does that mean? That means we, we don't think about R itself. We just think about THH of R as an E infinity ring and we apply this even filtration. And what we prove is that we get the motivic filtration. So this motivic filtration was defined uh, by Morin and Bot Lurie uh, based on some more uh, intense work of Bot Mora Schulze. And what Morin and Bot Lurie do was glue together a p-adic version of the motivic filtration at every prime with some rational information to get some kind of global version. And BMS did the, the hard work of really coming up with um, the p-adic, the p-completed motivic filtration. And the way they do that is they descend using perfectoid rings and quasi-regular semi-perfectoid rings in this quasi-syntomic site. And so um, I, I'm happy that to a homotopy theorist who's comfortable with E infinity rings, uh, all that perfectoid ring stuff can be, uh, can be bound up into just saying, take this even filtration. Um, so it's something very simple. And so uh, also you might worry that these hypotheses, you might think they're somewhat restrictive, but in particular, they include polynomial rings. And once you have a functorial even filtration for polynomial rings, you can left con extend and get it for any animated ring. So just using the notion of evenness, one can recover this global motivic filtration for any animated classical ring. Um, okay, I want to study things like THH of KU, though, the things that David studied, which aren't necessarily classical. So I'm going to formulate a definition of an E infinity ring that is nice. And nice means chromatically quasi symptomic. And the idea is that in the case of a classical ring, a discrete ring, this just reduces to that niceness condition I had previously. But what should it mean for an E infinity ring to have a nice even filtration on its THH? 
Well, I think the condition we settled on is that the MU homology of that ring should be even. And when considered as an ungraded commutative ring, it should have the same niceness conditions as in the discrete case. So we call this a chromatically quasi-syntomic E infinity ring. So it includes you know, all these classical examples, but also the sphere, MU, KU, KO, TMF. If you take the MU homology of KO or TMF, you just get a polynomial ring on even generators, even though KO and TMF themselves are not even in any sense. Um, right, so, um, so yeah, so for those chromatically quasi-syntomic E infinity rings, we're just gonna go ahead and define the motivic filtration to be the even filtration. So our justification for that is on the one hand, um, it produces the right notion in the classical setup, given this niceness assumption that we're assuming here in some form, um, but uh, I'm gonna now try to explain some other reasons why this collection of chromatically quasi-syntomic E infinity rings is particularly nice, and, and we should particularly believe that this even filtration is the motivic filtration. Um, okay, are there any questions before I go on? I guess people will, will ask them if there are. Um, okay, so I want to talk not just about THH, but also about TC, TP, TC minus, things like that. And so we're going to use this Nicolas Schultz definition of a cyclotomic E infinity ring. So this is an S1 equivariant E infinity ring. And I just mean that in the Borel notion, the most naive possible notion. So um, nothing. Uh, nothing having to do with a genuine equivariant homotopy theory, just a ring, E infinity ring with an S1 action by E infinity ring maps. And uh, what Nicolas Schultz do is, is say that that is a cyclotomic E infinity ring if it's furthermore equipped with the data of an S1 equivariant Frobenius map, which goes from the ring to its Tate CP. Um, okay, so really, I think maybe the most technically difficult part of our paper is this uh, theorem here, which is the reason why we settled on this definition chromatically quasi-syntomic. So what do we do? We show that if R is one of these rings whose MU homology is really nice, then we can find a map of cyclotomic E infinity rings such that um, the underlying E infinity ring map is evenly free and the E infinity ring underlying B is even. So what that means is that we can study THH of R by descending the even filtration along this evenly free map and understand what we get because B itself, the even filtration will just be the double feed Posnikov filtration. Um, but not only do we have this evenly free map to an even ring, but that's actually somehow compatible with the cyclotomic structure on THH. That's what we can guarantee exists when we have a chromatically quasi-syntomic E infinity ring. That we can choose this B to be uh, a cyclotomic E infinity ring and this map to be one of cyclotomic E infinity rings. Okay, so once we have that, so we make one of these choices of a map from THHA to B where B is even um, and everything is, uh, everything is a cyclotomic E infinity ring, then we can go ahead and, and define the motivic filtration on TP by this formula. So again, uh, sorry, this should say tensor dot plus one here, I'll update that. Right. So we're, we're descending, this should say B tensor over A dot plus one TS1. Um, so you take the descent object, you take TS1, and all of the terms in the descent object are even, so their TS1, their Tate spectral sequences will collapse to even things, and we take the double speed Posnikov truncation. So this is, um, this is some filtration, uh, and we prove that it's independent of the choice of B. So it depends on the S1 equivariant action on B, which is part of the cyclotomic structure, but it turns out not to matter what we choose B as and not to matter what this map is. Um, okay, so we're gonna call the associated graded prismatic cohomology, and that's because in the case of discrete rings, what this formula recovers is the brewer kissin uh, twisted Nygaard completed absolute prismatic cohomology which is exactly the thing that uh, Ben uh, brought up first in his talk and Akhil a little bit also. Um, so this is like a, a definition of that just purely sort of in terms of, of evenness. 
Um, okay. Uh, and then similarly, again, this should have a dot plus one here, but um, we have uh, the descent object for TC. Uh, we can calculate a filtration, a motivic filtration on P completed topological cyclic homology. Uh, and we compute that by, um, by taking the, what is essentially the two star minus one connected cover of TC of B tensor dot plus one. Um, and again, this is somehow independent of the choice as long as A was a chromatically quasi syntomic E infinity ring. So something like S, M, U, T, N, F, et cetera. Uh, okay, and this um, we prove recovers these syntomic complexes that Akil gave a, a really nice overview of. I um, mean, we'll recover, uh, that's this filtered object, we'll recover um, the syntomic complexes when A is discrete and if you if you plug in Z, you can read off this sigma double prime object that Akil was talking about and all those things. So they all sort of um, come uh, from, from evenness, if you like. Uh, right, so, all right, so that's most of what I wanted to talk about. I think I'm going a little bit fast, but maybe I'll end by just, uh, just showing a computation, right? So we've now defined syntomic cohomology. We can talk about the spectral sequence, the motivic spectral sequence for TC, which is essentially the same data as algebraic K theory. And so Ben showed, for example, how to calculate that motivic spectral sequence for Z mod P to the N. And we want to calculate it now for just other chromatically quasi syntomic E infinity rings, not just Z or Z mod P to the N. So um, here's the answer for the atom sum end. Uh, so we do this in the paper. So um, if we look at the uh, atom sum n, that's a, the sum n of uh, p local k theory. So here I've written the phi primary one. So this is a sum n of five local k theory. Um, and I'm not gonna compute the TC, uh, at least we don't in this paper. In this paper, we compute the TC mod five and D one. So some kind of, uh, uh, you know, this is the analog of computing something like the TC of Z with FP coefficients instead of just computing the TC of Z integrally. Um, but it's the first thing you would do to start computing the TC of, of L integrally. And it already gives a pretty interesting answer. So here's the um, motivic spectral sequence. It has four lines. Uh, each dot on this line is a, is a generator of an F5 adjoined V2. So there's some classes that are omitted, which are the V2 powers of V2 on all these dots. Every one of these dots has a, has a power of V2 extending off to the right. Um, and uh, yeah, but this is the answer. Um, and one can see immediately just for bi degree reasons that the spectral sequence, the motivic spectral sequence, which goes from these four syntomic cohomology groups, each horizontal row is it's one syntomic cohomology and, and it goes to um, goes to V1 star TC of L. Uh, okay, so this degenerates. Um, maybe just a few comments about the answer. So uh, if you look in Ragnus's ICM address, you'll see a picture that looks strikingly like this, which was his conjectured motivic spectral sequence. So I think you could say that we've made sort of a, a rigorous motivic spectral sequence that Ragnus hoped for. But his was for algebraic K theory and ours is for TC. Um, another thing to note is that there's this uh, rotational symmetry in the picture. Um, and this is a kind of local tape duality. So uh, what seems to be the case is that for many of these chromatically quasi syntomic rings like L, uh, they behave like rings of integers in a number field. Um, so in particular, L behaves a lot like the uh, the ring of integers in a two-dimensional local field. And you see here um, this kind of Tate duality. There's this, this uh, product structure here exhibits a kind of Poincaré duality and this rotational symmetry. And um, it looks, you know, computationally quite plausible that they're analogs of a lot of the things Akil talked about. Um, but uh, I know this is largely unexplored. I, I hope it winds up being interesting, but it seems like a, something to explore anyway. Uh, so thank you, that's all I got.